Everybody's attention, please. So I'd like to give everybody a very warm welcome to the Victorian Chapter 2024 International Women's Day Luncheon. My name is Stephanie Bullock and I'm a director at Kozloff Architecture and I also sit on the Institute's Victorian Chapter Council. And it's my honour to be your host and moderator for today's event. Today we meet on the lands of the Wurundjeri Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I acknowledge with deep respect the traditional owners of this land. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and to the wider Aboriginal community here in Victoria that continue to care for country as well as the traditional owners of the lands on which we are situated. We acknowledge that it is a privilege to stand on country and walk in the footsteps of those before us and we pay our respects to their elders again past, present and emerging. Count her in. Invest in women, accelerate progress. This is the United Nations International Women's Day theme for this year. While we celebrate the strides that have been made, recent revelations from the Parler Census Report, Gender and Diversity in Australian Architecture, 2001 to 2021, and the inaugural release of the Gender Pay Gaps data by the Workplace Gender Equity Equality Agency, illustrate that there is much work yet to do. As we gather today, we are presented with an invaluable opportunity to pause and reflect on the pivotal career stages of learn, earn and lead that are indispensable to the economic empowerment of women. These reflections compel us to examine not only the progress that we've achieved, but also the road ahead, where our collective efforts must drive real and lasting change. This event is only made possible through the invaluable support of our partners and sponsors. Our Victorian major partner, the City of Melbourne, deserves special recognition for their crucial contribution in bringing this event to fruition. We would also like to say a special thanks to our national partner, Fielders Lysart, for sponsoring the International Women's Day's events at the Institute's Chapter Councils Australia-wide. Our heartfelt gratitude extends to our supporting partners and Total Synergy for their significant support also. Total Synergy has further extended their generosity by presenting each of us with a special gift today. Special thanks also to Stylecraft for furnishing the stage with their exquisite furniture and to Collective Futures for generously sponsoring the recording of this event. Your support is truly invaluable and we are deeply grateful for your contributions. Before we proceed with our first speaker, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping matters. Restrooms can be found behind the stage to your left, while emergency exits can be found behind the stage on both the left and right, and two behind you through the glass um, facade. Lastly, can I ask you all to please have your mobile phone switched to silent mode. I would now like to warmly welcome to the stage the President of the Victorian Chapter of the Australian Institute of Architects, David Wagner. Thanks, Steph. So, on behalf of the Institute, I'd like to welcome you uh, all here to this uh, fantastic celebration of International Women's Day and in our new luncheon format too, which uh, hopefully makes things more accessible for everybody. Um, now, this is also on a Friday too, which means we can continue to celebrate onto the weekend, so that, that's, that's uh, most enjoyable. Now, I acknowledge with deep respect the traditional owners of this land, and I would also like to remind everyone in attendance today of our collective responsibility uh, to create safe spaces, both within the workplaces we inhabit and at events such as this, where we celebrate our industry. We enjoy an inherently diverse and complex social fabric. It is important to understand, recognise and respect the differences that build a strong, inclusive community. It is great that today's event, celebrating women in architecture, is so valued and supported by our community. The United Nations states that gender equity is not only a fundamental human right, but a necessary foundation for a, a peaceful, prosperous and sustainable world. Inevitably, a healthy discussion about equity involves all people, First Nations, migrants, old, young, male, female, LGBTQI and all cultural and religious groups is an inclusive conversation where understanding and acknowledgement of others, their needs, nuances and circumstances is fundamental to achieve real equity. Late last year, the Victorian chapter of the Institute established a Gender Equity and Diversity Committee that complements the long-established National Committee for Gender Equity. I'm pleased to say that the number of our Victorian chapter councillors immediately jumped at the opportunity to join the committee and have started considering how we might further broaden and strengthen involvement and opportunity for all members, in particular that of women. 
in Victoria, as of the 31st of January 2024, we have 4,097 members, almost a third of the national membership. Of those members, uh, 1,497, or 36%, are female. We're conscious that female graduates of Victorian schools of architecture currently number about 60% of all architecture graduates. So it's the Institute's objective to address the imbalance of membership. To this end, there have been significant efforts to promote female involvement, uh, including the introduction of membership rates for members on reduced working weeks or parental leave, encouraging involvement of young parents through the Young Architects Imagine category, and establishment of gatherings such as uh, Archibubs. The Institute of Architects has a gender equity policy available on our website, which enumerates a, a series of principles to ensure that the Institute and its members are aligned in valuing and exhibiting principles of fairness, leading to the provision of equal opportunities, rights and benefits to all people engaged with the architectural profession, regardless of gender, and so eliminate gender-based impacts on the participation and progression of women within the profession. Principle 11 of this document states, demonstrate leadership on gender balance on all institute activities. The institute will make every effort to achieve a 40-40-20 gender balance. Uh, in all organisational public activities. So that's 40% women, 40% male, and 20% any gender. This includes, but is not limited to, membership of leadership of institute committees, juries, representation of conferences, participation of event programs and panel discussions, institute endorsement of and participation of external panels, conferences, and competitions. Now, clearly, I acknowledge today's celebration is an exception in that respect. Um, our current chapter council, including the immediate past president and myself, has eight women and six men. The institute convenes a series of committees, working groups and forums, which many of you will be involved in, uh, from the practice of architecture to uh, heritage, sustainability, and of course, the gender equity and diversity committee. So there are currently 11 women and nine men chairing these groups, uh, often as co-chairs. Hence, the Victorian leadership and uh, of the Institute complies with the 40-40-20 principle. Indeed, it's fair to say that women are providing considerably more leadership in this uh, context, given the overall membership numbers. The proportional representation of the Institute's National Council is similar. It would be fabulous to see these proportions reflected in our general membership. Indeed, what we must always be conscious of is not simply the numbers, but the quality of opportunity that reflects true equity and will lead to a more harmonious, prosperous and sustainable industry. These are exciting times and I look forward to participating in further transformation of our institute and our profession. Thank you. Thanks, David. I'd now like to warmly welcome Director of City Design at City of Melbourne, Jocelyn Shu. Thank you, Steph and David, um, and happy International Women's Day. So the City of Melbourne is proud to partner with the Australian Institute of Architects in sponsoring today's event. I'm Jocelyn Chu, I'm the Director of City Design at the City of Melbourne, and I would like to begin by acknowledging that we're gathered on the, on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin and to pay my respect to their elders past and present. Today, I also pay special tribute to women elders, at the City of Melbourne, we are genuinely committed to equity, diversity and inclusion and are doing our part to support and empower women to learn, earn and lead at every stage of their journey. Sorry, this microphone's a bit distracting. It's very in your face. <laughs> We're leading by example, ensuring that gender equity underpins our policies, planning, services and practices as set out in our gender equality statement of commitment action plan, safety and empowerment action plan, and inclusive Melbourne strategy, and all of these documents are available publicly. This year, the organisation has also introduced training on leading psychologically safe teams and menopause in the workplace, as well as, an, as introducing a gender equality staff group. And it's initiatives like, the, like these that help women like me to feel seen and supported. Nationally, women account for a disappointing 22% of CEOs and 35% of key management positions. At the city, I'm inspired by the many warm and accomplished women in leadership 
where we have a woman CEO and a woman Lord Mayor and a leadership team that comprises nearly 50% women. I'm also proud to share that women comprise 56% of all staff in city design, council's in-house multidisciplinary design studio, and that within our team of 43, we have a gender pay gap of minus 0.1%. Indicate... <laughs> Thank you. Um, indicating um, equality in earnings. Aligned with the Victorian Gender Equality Act, we are continuing to roll out and refine how we apply gender impact assessments to our projects. We've found that the best outcomes are achieved when teams are diverse and gender balanced and applying an intersectional lens at every stage of a project's journey. We have a working group that holds monthly community of practice workshops to help project teams to apply an intersectional lens to projects. And we are developing an inclusive design guide to promote and deliver an integrated approach to designing sustainable, resilient, ac accessible and affordable solutions to the challenges faced by our diverse communities. So collating all of the learnings from all of the, um, all of, of the processes that I've just described. So with the support of empathetic and inclusive leaders, women, men and gender diverse persons, equity has become a hallmark of our design excellence program. I have to apologise, I took some liberties with this speech. I'm very passionate about gender equity. Um, so it's a little bit longer than what you would find in a regular sponsor's um, introduction. But I hope you'll humour me, I'm about halfway through. I've got some interesting anecdotes and history to share that are not just about the city of Melbourne. So thanks again for having me. Um, our Melbourne Design Review Panel, of which there are members in today's audience, comprise 52% women. And over the past year, we've updated our terms of reference to request the equitable participation of women in presenting project teams. I'm pleased to report that we've seen a shift from 14% in 2022 to 33% in 2023, and we're not stopping there. We know there is more to do. In 2021, with guidance from our Design Excellence Advisory Committee, we launched the Excellence Cities series to promote public debate on design excellence. To date, we've hosted 13 events prioritising diverse voices from community, industry and academia through unique formats including poetry, meditation, collage, sculpture, dance, music and discussion. And all of that sounds pretty kind of strange way to connect with people. But the approach has helped us to break down barriers between whose voices are welcomed and heard in city shaping processes and what, and what lived experiences we are designing for. So we are also supporting commemorative justice. And I just want to share a little bit of context here um, with a, a 2020 quote from Professor Claire Wright. In 1902, Australia became the first country in the world where women won, they were not given, they won the full political, equal, full political equality with men, that is, the right to vote and to stand in parliament. So the first country in the world where this happened. So what have we got to show for women's suffrage? We have the centenary of women's suffrage memorial fish pond beside the wheelie bins in Canberra. <laughs> Appalling. <laughs> Today, of 581 statues in the city, only 10 celebrate women, less than 2%. As I've shared with some of you before, there are more statues of mythical creatures, of fairies and nymphs and animals, than of real women. I'd like to share another quote from Professor Wright. You can tell I'm a fan. When you walk down our streets and you see all these men on pedestals, you don't know who they are, you don't know what they've done, but you subliminally read the information in our civic landscape, which says that person was important. He did something significant. Then you look at the next bloke and the next bloke and the next bloke. And the way that you learn to read a city is that men did important things. Men are allowed to take up space. We conversely read that women didn't do anything important. 
and women do not deserve to take up space. And these things start to be internalised by not, on, not only by girls, but also by boys very early on. And so at the City of Melbourne, we're committed to closing the respect and commemorative gap. Last year, together with the Trades Hall and a monument of one's own, we unveiled a statue of Zelda de Prano, a lifelong activist for equal pay rights. In 1969, Zelda and two trade union activists chained themselves to the door of the Australian sorry, to the door of the Arbitration Commission in Melbourne. According to Zelda, there was just sufficient chain to allow the door to open slightly and people had to bend down and crawl in sideways to, open, to, to enter the building. And this was so undignified for the important people. In another protest, Zelda only paid 75% of an adult tram fare arguing that women did not receive the same wages as men and should not be expected to pay the same amount as men. We are fast-tracking three more statues of significant Victorian women, including Vita Goldstein, the first woman to run for parliament in Australia. We're making great strides, but there is so much more to do. So I challenge you to think about how you are enabling gender equity through your work. Who are you choosing to work on project teams and to present as leaders of our profession? How are you applying an inclusive and intersectional lens to your projects? Thank you for being here today. I'm looking forward to hearing from our esteemed panellists and happy International Women's Day. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. I'd now like to welcome Costa Cairis, Architectural Business Development Manager for Victoria and Tasmania, to say a few words on behalf of our national partner, Builders Lysart. Every day I have the privilege of working with amazing and inspiring women who serve as role models within the business and beyond. There's a really great diverse bunch of people that support whatever you need. Every day I'm inspired by the strong women in our business, forging new paths and career opportunities. I kind of put my hand up to learn the machines. People share their knowledge. And I'm also inspired and proud to represent a business that continues to demonstrate a proactive strategy to gender equality opportunities. The training here has been second to none. I have worked in a lot of different facets for the company and they've given me that opportunity to do that. Working for a business that supports equality, inclusion and diversity will help us work towards a more inclusive world. Thanks for the introduction, Stephanie. Um, Fielders and Lice are, are incredibly proud to be sponsoring this International Women's Day as it aligns with Blue Scope values and gender equality, inclusion and diversity in the workplace. For me personally, it's a privilege uh, to work alongside inspiring and amazing women who are role models both in and out of my workplace. Um, so let's celebrate today, acknowledge the women that are equal partners with men in all aspects of the economic, political and social life. Women should be able to work and have a family life and we should all be free to live our lives without discrimination, harassment and violence. Together, we can create a world we are proud to hand down to our grandchildren. Happy International Women's Day. Thank you so much, Costa. Today, we have the privilege of exploring the theme, Count Her In, Invest in Women, Accelerate Progress, in the context of women's economic empowerment in architecture. Guided by the insights of the Parler Census Report, Gender and Diversity in Australian Architecture, 2001 to 2021, the upcoming panel discussion will centre around the key career stages of learn, earn and lead. We'd like to encourage your active engagement throughout today's session by scanning the QR code, which will shortly be on the screen behind me, uh, but also by briefly stating an action that you plan today to take inspired by the discussion today. We hope that today isn't just about celebration, but is also about what can each of us do personally. We look forward to sharing our collective responses and actions after the panel discussion has taken place. To guide us through this insightful conversation, we're honoured to have Georgia Burks as our moderator. 
Georgia Berks is an associate editor at Architecture Media, a graduate of architecture and a proud descendant of the Burupi, Dungushi and Kamalarari people. She is joined by an esteemed panelist of speakers, namely Felicity Douglas, Managing Director at NH Architecture, Dr. Julian Mathewson, Senior Lecturer at Monash University, Sonia Serengi, Director at Endeavour, and Anne Michaels, Founder and Director at SheBuilt. Let's give them all a warm round of applause. Well, thank you, Stephanie. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to be here on Wurundjeri Warrior Run Country today. The Kulin Nation is turning it on with the weather. Um, uh, I'll just uh, introduce myself as well again. I am Georgia Burks, and I'm a proud Kimilaroi, Birupai, and Dungadi woman, as well as Associate Editor at Architecture Media. We are in for a great discussion today as we hear from our panelists exchange knowledge and tips which are critical to women's economic empowerment. And as Steph said, if you'd like to be part of this conversation, there'll be a QR code which you can scan and send through questions um, for the panel and we'll ask these towards the end. Um, with me on stage, we have the wonderful Sonia who is founder and director of Endeavour and has a portfolio of architectural experience experiences both overseas and locally. She is, as well as this, she is a mentor to many and an advocate for cultural diversity in the built environment. Uh, we also have Anne, who is to the left of Sonia there, who owns property and development company She Built, which is an organisation that helps to empower women in the built environment. Um, she also has over 20 years of, of hands-on experience in both property property development and property investment. Um, we have Felicity, who um, has run large-scale and complex architectural projects both in Australia and overseas, and she drives diversity and inclusion efforts at NH Architecture. Recently, she spearheaded an expanded parental leave scheme and implementation of flexible work strategies. And last but not least, we have Jill, who focuses on building bridges from research into making real difference in lives and careers of women in the built environment professions at Parlour and in the daily lives of women using public spaces at XYX Lab. She also had a leading role in the creation of the Parla 2021 Census Report, which this conversation is guided by today. Now, even though the Parla 2021 Census Report was collected from three years ago, unfortunately, the gender pay gap still exists. Just last week, the Workplace Gender Equity Agency WGEA, published the gender pay gap data for more than 5,000 private employers with 100 or more employees for 2022 to 2023. And among the architecture and landscape architecture practices that reported data to WGEA, all but two are among the 50% of employers with a gender pay gap of more than 9.1%. So just keep that in mind as we sort of have that discussion through today. But pulling it back to the Parlour 2021 Census Report, Jill, I think you, it'd be great if you could start us off. Um, can you just give us a really brief, brief background on the Parlour's Parler, report and the limitations that were there? Am I on? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, Limitations, we didn't have any limitations in the census report. <laughs> it's fabulous. Um, no, there are limitations. There are limitations because the data comes from the census. And one of the good things about the census is that it counts everybody. And you'll know from filling it in yourself um, that it asked you, you know, how did you earn, did you earn any money in the previous two weeks? And how did you earn that money? That's how we find our architects. Um, so, I know that there are probably many, many more um, architects out there, but it's whether you earn your living as an architect. So, that's what the census counts. Um, there are great things because it counts everybody. We can, we can look at huge kind of patterns when we clump everyone together, but that's also a limitation because when you clump everyone together, it's you know, you're forgetting that actually we're all a little bit different as well. Um, this uh, report, we were, we started diving into cultural diversity, uh, or what the what the report 
uh, what the census could tell us about that. And that was really hard because it's, it's a very blunt in instrument. It, it kind of says, mm -hmm. where were you born? What language do you speak at home? And what, what, do, you, what you, do you define as your descent? And, you know, when I was filling it in and I was thinking, well, I'm actually from New Zealand, but my parents came from the UK. What do, what do I put down there? You know, um, so we're, that's kind of, it's a blunt instrument, but it did tell us that there were some whopping great pay gaps. Um, yeah. Enormous. Yeah, one of the, just on that there, Jill, the, the report identified the three biggest pay gaps for women working full time were between the ages of 40 to 44, which was at 10.9%, 40, 45 to 49, which was at 13.7%, and 50 to 54, which was 11%. And I was actually really surprised to see the gap widen, widen during this decade, um, where women of this age, to me, seem well established and, and know who they are and what they're worth. Um, and so I guess my question just... For, for the moment is, and I'll, and I'll pass to you, but Jill, I know you're going to have some, something to say on this, but now that we do have the WGEA report in the public domain, how can women in this age group or other age groups use this to their advantage to discuss the poor representation of women in the upper pay quartile with their employer and perhaps in turn fight for greater income, opportunity and responsibility? Thanks, Georgia. Um, one of the first things that I did as a younger person um, and one of the things that we can do with this information is information is power, information is knowledge and you have the power and the knowledge then to go and ask. You, if you have confidence in yourself, in your abilities, um, and that's one thing that women, we don't do very well. So you need to sell yourself to yourself first mm. that you have that confidence. And then with the information that you have, like the pay gap now, the information and any other, uh, I guess, career pay salary information you can gather, research, you ask for it. You go and see your managers or your um, superiors and say, this is what I'm worth and this is the research I've found and if you don't agree, tell me otherwise. You have to have, I guess, that hard conversation. Mm -hmm. Jill, did you have any thoughts on that as well? Uh, well, lots. Um, I interviewed uh, about 70 women and men architects for my PhD, which, out of which grew parlour and all sorts of other things. I remember one woman uh, she found, I interviewed, she found that she was being paid $5,000 less than the guy sitting next to her doing exactly the same job. I went, oh, what did you do? She said, I was so angry. And she said, and then I grew some balls and went and demanded the money, which I thought was really interesting that she thought she had to act like a man in, in order to um, ask for more money, but she did it and she got it. So, you know, fake it till you make it. Yeah. Yeah. Pretend you got the ball. <laughs> um, Sonia and Felicity, I want to hear if you have any thoughts on this as well, but um, do, how do you think that, do you think that the, the public... Um, backs from the WGEA are going to be useful to negotiate um, more pay. Um, Sonia, I know we've talked about this in our last discussion, should um, the architectural industry have a transparent pay scale? My answer to this is mixed. Um, now, only because the general way we understand a pay scale is a range, right? If you are... Um, you know, a grad with X kind of one to four years experience, this is a kind of range that you get put into. Now that's something, it's a data point, and so more transparency I'm absolutely in favor of. What I am a little more keen to actually see instead is actually medians, mm. because there is a tendency for practices to default to the lowest end of the range. And then the compounding effect is that it takes you four years to get out of the range, as in to get to the top of that range, which if we all look at an inflationary environment means you're actually going backwards every year. So I would much rather actually have medians come out um, because then it just becomes this one number. 
And then it kind of takes away this license to shove people down towards the bottom end of the spectrum and also shifts the conversation towards value, your specific value. And actually, you're just having that conversation of, I am above the median because I brought X, Y, Z value to the table. And so the conversation changes when it becomes a bit more of a specific number. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a bit harder for practices to have get out of jail closes. And that kind of loops into what Anne was saying about come with facts. Um, Felicity, oh, oh sorry, Sonia, you were going to say? Um, I was going to say, um, with negotiations and around pay, um, one thing I've always said is never be the first person to come up with a number. Mm. I have given this advice to many mentees over the year. And again, that is because you force the other person to articulate you, what your value is to the business. Uh, every time I've done this, I've been very good at masking my very happy reaction at the higher number that I received than what I was expecting, and likewise. So don't blink first. <laughs> that is a solid tip. I'm going to take that one too. Felicity, do you have any other advice for negotiating pay or flexibility in, your, in, in work? I think lots of great advice been given already, but I would say that that is a very good tip. Um, I've used it myself in the past, and um, but again, also talking to um, knowing your value and speaking up and taking any opportunity, not to just talking to maybe the one director that you think is the person that makes the decisions, um, be talking to your whole leadership team and making clear what your aspirations are, uh, where you want to go, where you are at the moment, and. Um, getting a sense of where your aspirations are, where the company's aspirations are, um, and how you, you value yourself, and um, also expanding on to ensure people know that they may only see one dimension of you because they're maybe not working with you on the variety of projects they're working on it with one. It's making sure everybody knows um, uh, your value to the practice, um, and also your experiences, because we may not come in contact with you all the time. So it's just taking opportunity to tell people where you want to go, where you want to be now, and, um, and valuing yourself in that salary conversation as well. Um, and I would say, if, you, if you're not happy with the first answer, don't be deterred and go back and have another. Oh, Sonia? One last point I just want to build off Felicity's extra fantastic point is that um, often in these situations, you can kind of be in your own head and only go me, me, me. But it really helps that negotiation that you were talking about when you put yourself in the shoes of the person across the table. Now, it may seem like they have all the power, but actually they have fear points too. So if you go prepared with what are, what are their resistance points coming from a place of fear, it becomes a conversation, shifts from a negotiation to a conversation. So it would be really good if you did that prep before you came to that table. That's a good mindset to have. Um, and did you have anything to add there? Um, I just wanted to, I guess, comment a little bit on the statistics. One of the things that we um, didn't look at is the early age group, which is, I think was 24 to 29, was that right? Um, what surprised me with those stats in 2021 and also 20, 2016, is there is a significant gap, pay gap, in those lower age ranges. Um, and you would think that at those lower range or low ages, um, women haven't stepped out of the workforce at this stage. We've just come into it. We're graduates, we've entered, just the same as our male counterparts. So I ask us, why is there a pay gap then? That's systemic from years and history of women not working or their wages being pegged at 80% of men's, we still have a pay gap at that early entry. And so I think we need to work on that as well. Yeah. That said, I think people have worked. So in 2016, it was like 5.6%. And a lot of people were going, what? And as they should. Um, and in 2021, it's come down to half that, which is really good, but let's get it zero for 2026. And that means everybody completely agree. Um, sort of shifting from graduates now to um, owners of the business and leaders, um, when it comes to having greater responsibility like owning an incorporated business, the 2021 Parla report 
only counted 52 women that employed 20 or more people, whereas 926 women had zero employees. Jill, is this because of society's gender roles or did the data show other factors at play? Um, it's quite hard when you get numbers that small to kind of see what the other factors might be. Uh, so that, get, that gets a bit tricky. Um, yeah, uh, uh, this is the first year we really looked at that 20 plus. We, we suddenly discovered this question in the census and thought, oh, ooh, that'll give us more information. And it is amazing, only 1%, I think it is, of um, women owners uh, in practices that employ more than 20 people. That's, that's chintzy, absolutely chintzy. Uh, I, I think there is an expectation in larger practices, and frankly, 20 people is not a terribly large practice, is it? Um, to, to kind of think that if you're at that upper level, ownership level, that you are 300% focused on the practice. And that if you have children, someone else looks after them. Your partner takes on the major role. And I think that ability to be able to share parental responsibility, it's not all about being a mother, but um, there's an expectation when you become a mother that you're not going to be interested in that kind of work or that kind of uh, level of, uh, I, I think they call it commitment, but I think it's um, overwork, really. Felicity, <laughs> I know you'll have something to add to this as well, but I'm particularly interested um, to know about your path as well. Um, Anne and Sonia both own their own businesses, but you have gone down a different pathway. And I'm curious to know, how can female employees position themselves to be considered as part of the succession plan? Um, do you have any advice on that? And any other comments on what Jill's just said as well? Well, I can only speak to my own story, which was, you know, certainly not linear. Um, but I think I had a a big revelation when I came to Australia in 2010. I worked for a large practice and the uh, two leaders of the business were female. I had never encountered that before in my time working overseas. And I found that was, you know, that additional uh, uh, light I needed to see that I could actually do that for myself. Um, it didn't work out at that practice. I was there on a sponsorship, um, uh, but I knew that that was the kind of place that I wanted to work for. And I approached uh, my next step to find a practice like it. And it took me a while. I had a few steps in between, um, and I chased NH hard. Um, <laughs> but I found a culture that was supportive um, to me. There was some great female leadership there also you know, alongside um, uh, the founders and the practice as well. That was really important because I felt comfortable there. There was a culture um, of uh, collaboration and support, um, which facilitated me um, learning that my route to where I am now is uh, about finding my niche and growing that, being an expert at that, mm -hmm. and then letting the people know about it. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and building on that skill set um, because, you know, we, there's, it's such a multifaceted um, profession architecture. There's many different routes to get to a leadership position. Um, and yeah, I would, I mentor um, many staff in my practice and I'll tell everybody the same thing. Find your niche and build on that. Um, and then keep having the conversations, telling people, this is my aspiration, this is what I want. Um, even if you feel like you might never get there, you know, yourself. Um, it's fake it till you make it, in a sense. Um, and uh, open, open your own doors. <laughs> because um, people are generally so focused on what they're getting out of their careers that um, they may not see your aspirations unless you tell them. But generally, you'll find, if you find a supportive, collaborative practice, they'll support you to get there. And so would you suggest, say, if you're not having any luck with your manager, if you're working at a big practice mm -hmm. who you work directly with, would you suggest to people to go to another person in Absolutely. the firm and have that conversation? Absolutely, because we all communicate differently. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, y 
you know, we don't all have the same insight. So um, if you're at a, a medium or a large size practice, there will generally be other people in the leadership team that you can go and build a, a rapport with um, and ask them for what they think might be a route for you to go forward. Ask for many voices so then you can guide yourself through. Thanks, Felicity. Sonia and Anne, I really want to hear about the moment that you decided to start your own businesses. Um, what triggered that moment and why does this work for you? And can we start with you? Um, if I can split my, I guess, career into two, two halves. Uh, first half, I say I lived in the corporate world, climbing the corporate ladder and I was going to get there. Um, I was determined. I'd ask for what I thought I deserved, and and I was on a I was on a path to leading. Um, my life turned around um, when I lost my first son, um, and at the time, it was it was as you can imagine traumatic, but it changed my perspective in life, um, and I decided that I wanted to do something that. I wanted to have my children, but I wanted my cake as well. So I wanted to succeed and run my own business. So that was my turning point. So at, that's my second half of my career. So I started a property development business back in 20, 2002 um, and have been doing it ever since. So that enabled me to have flexibility, enabled me to take my children to school, to do all the things parents do, but then to also run my, my own business and run a successful business because I had control of my own time, commitments and my own destiny. Mm. Fantastic. Sonia? So what triggered it is the question. A moment of white hot rage <laughs> that helped me have the clarity to identify a golden opportunity when it emerged. So I'm going to try to frame that story just in a slightly broad, broader term because I have realized in hindsight through many years of mentoring that my story is sadly not even very unique, at least the beginnings of it. Um, so architecture doesn't take practice, doesn't take very well to being second place. So I decided to birth human and came back to uh, work part-time at four months and full-time at nine months. In order to even do that, I essentially physically and mentally destroyed myself, but um, I was really committed to the clients and the projects and the team that I had spent five, six years with at that point. But I came back to find I was no longer allowed to lead projects, I was gaslit against being encouraged in pursuing a senior role and I was actively excluded from being put in front of other people. So the sign was really bright and flashing. You chose motherhood. Exit stage left. Talk about behaving like a toxic boyfriend. So <laughs> that moment of white hot rage clarity knowing it does not matter if I destroy myself, I will never be valued. Um, I decided, all right, throw the towel in, go to academia. Um, I'm now naive enough to realize that academia is not a perfect paragon either. Um, but um, while in the midst of that moment, um, my colleague, who was the person I trusted um, and collaborated the most in that office, said, hey, I'm leaving. Um, why are you still here? I didn't have an answer to that question, and I didn't even know what the answer was. I was just mad. Um, three weeks later, that same colleague goes, hey, do you, do you think we should do this together? And first response is, hell no, no, that's not part of the plan. Like, no, this is terrifying. Um, three weeks later, yes, I'm coming with you. That person is my co-director, Michael, who's sitting in front of me. Um, how we got started? Um, Look, you just bring in a couple of uh, thousands of your savings and a laptop, um, and, on the <laughs> and on day one, you have a beanbag, a dining chair, and a really long to-do list. Sounds uh, lovely. <laughs> but the harder thing, and I just want to touch on that, is the harder thing was actually convincing my partner to let me take this courageous leap, which I was, courage doesn't mean absence of fear. I was still terrified, but I was going to do it anyway. 
So I had to talk him to make a pitch to my own husband. <laughs> I made a business case with the worst, best scenario. I guarantee you the first three years were the worst scenario. And um, we, I had to commit to an exit point in those in, at around the three-year mark. If this couldn't happen, I had to give up on this. And that's because um, being able to have a roof over your head and food on the table, on you know, when one person in a unit has taken a massive pay cut, is is a privilege that I think a lot of people do not have in this current economic climate. So, yeah, that was the start. White heart rage. <laughs> Brilliant. And did you have an exit point or part that you go, oh, I have to call it here? Unlike Sonia, I didn't have to negotiate with her husband or a partner, so I, <laughs> I made my own decisions. Um, in terms of an exit, the only thing that defines an exit plan when you're running your own business is how do you support yourself? Yeah. Um, and that is a scary thing. A lot of people think, you know, set up your own business, it's easy because they're not, don't have to answer to all these other people, but you have to survive. Um, yeah, so I guess from a, a, an exit point of view, you're always just concerned or, or have to have backup for yourself so you can keep going forward, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, one question I wanted to ask both of you as well, just um, is, is when you're seeking advice on your own business strategies and financial decisions for your business, um, what are your measures or for a radar of trust in someone? How do you know that that's the person to talk to and they become your mentor? Um, for me, I've had a lot of people that I um, speak to ask advice from and the, the main thing on my radar is, one, that they actually listen. They, they, they listen to what I'm saying. And their feedback or their, their advice back to me actually is inclusive of my concerns and what I've thought about. So I know that they've heard me um, rather than just give me random, ram, random advice that you'd give to any generic situation. So trust is um, very, very important because, you know, you're dealing with yourself, your career, your, your future. So, yeah, it's someone who can give back what they heard from me and give me some assistance and, and guidance, yeah. Sonia? I agree with a lot of what Anne has said. Um, but to build upon that, for me, it is someone who is a strategic thinker and has risk for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So not someone who blindly rushes forward and not someone who's terrified, someone who has a bit of a 360 degree view of that, um, someone who's willing to question the status quo and is not too influenced by their peers because then I'm getting genuinely their thoughts. Mm. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you both and I can see how that, um, I guess, sort of those that analysis of, that, of a person applies to what Felicity you were saying in terms of speaking to lots of different people. You can find that person also within your own studio. I want to pivot here to another um, particular topic that came through in the Parlour Census report, which was about cultural diversity. diversity. And um, honestly, it was one of the most devastating but probably unsurprising results in the, in the report. Um, an intersectional analysis combining gender and cultural pay gaps revealed a 32% pay gap between full-time Northwest European men and full-time North African and Middle Eastern women. Um, Jill, I know in the report there are a couple of caveats for that particular type of data, such as age, but it doesn't discount the, the dominance of white men at senior levels in, in the profession. Um, it, this points to a massive power imbalance in the profession and the fact that opportunities are not equally available to all and that this is actually an issue about cultural background and race as well as gender. Um, I would like to hear from all panellists for the, from the next question, but Sonia, we'll start with you if that's okay. Um, as I know you have ideas about strategies that architecture studios can undertake to reduce or remove the power imbalance, such as de-identifying CVs. Um, can you expand on that idea? And if you have others, please share. Yes, yeah, so apologies to anybody who has, who's heard me parrot about this for six years, but blind recruitment. Blind recruitment being essentially that you de-identify a CV or folio. I can't even quote the number of studies all around the world that says when you do that, you let not only people who are culturally diverse in, you actually let in a lot of women in too. Like every other lens you can bring to diversity comes through. And look, I'm not asking practices to reinvent the wheel. Like 
it's, it's not even that hard. You know, you can start with a Google Sheet for applications rather than obviously their email ID revealing their name and their background, et cetera, et cetera, because that all reveals a lot. So a Google Sheet where a person's name and email comes spit out at the other end as just a column that you can then hide before that column is then forwarded onto the decision maker to parse through all the other skills and experiences, right? It's really not that hard. It's just how you think about it. And the other thing is also, um, particularly, uh, I'm talking here from accent bias. Um, it, I find it really strange that our biggest barometer, I mean, we are a conservative profession, but our biggest barometer is a face-to-face is -face interview, often, um, when 80% of our communication is emails. <laughs> so why, why is it so hard to put in one or two selection criteria questions? 100 words. You know, it's not long to read. It is amazing when you actually learn to do that, again, how you um, eliminate bias um, from, from those uh, processes. So we need to fix hiring because the door is slammed shut in way too many people's faces. Felicity, how are you tackling that in, um, at NH there? Um, we had a pre-discussion about this um, a couple of weeks ago, so um, to be ensured that we were doing things, you know, we're all learning and growing in this space and we, we only endeavour to do better all the time, to inc be inclusive of everyone. I, I, I talked to my team um, and we were de-identifying. Um, CVs already, which was wonderful to hear. Um, but we talked about some other um, uh, methodologies to how we, you know, when we have a short list of people that, you know, if we're still not at a 50-50 um, or we don't have representation from all, that we should go back and work harder on that list um, and maybe look at approaches also. Um, so yeah, it is really important. It's a gr like for us, it's a growing space for looking to do better all, all the time. Um, and we've put in a lot of policies over the last couple of years. Um, you know, with Parler coming on the scene in 2012, um, it was one of the things I know we talked about immediately then and I talked about with other practices um, since. Uh, they are a great way to ensure whatever your practice size that you are putting in place the right policies to get um, uh, gender equity and diversity um, within your practice as a starting point. Mm -hmm. Lots more to do. Mm -hmm. Jill or Anne, do you have anything to add on that question? Any suggestions? Oh, I'll, I'll do a sort of advert for the parlor guides to equitable practice. Uh, we first published these, I think it was 2014 or 15, something like that, and they are being reworked. So we've reflected on them and sort of thought, oh, we never, we never did a guide about harassment. That's a big hole that we need to fill. So we're, we're expanding them and we're rewriting them uh, based on stuff that, well, we've had a whole kind of process of consulting with people. Some of you in the room might have been consulted uh, and they should be coming out one by one later this year. So um, look out for those because we, we aim to give advice whether you've got a small practice, a medium practice, a big practice, and what you can do yourself. All, all these things, it needs to come from every single angle. And just, um, Felicity, you were talking about talking to different people if you're in a larger practice, but sometimes you might need to move practice. And uh, there's a thing, I think it's Goldilocks. Um, you, you know, you can try a big practice, a small practice, and not be comfortable. You've just got to keep moving until you find a place where you go, this is my tribe, this is where I belong, they believe what I believe about architecture, and this is where I'm going to stay. Mm. Absolutely. But you, you were saying, you were going to say something? No, I think it's so true. Well, from my personal experience, you know, when I had that revelation when I arrived in Australia, and didn't work out at that practice, but I took so much from it that, you know, there, you can have strong, powerful women in leadership, um, and collaborative workplaces that invest in you. Um, so I went out and searched for a practice that felt right for me. Once I found my place, it, mm -hmm. you know, it's worked out. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, any last comments on this before we jump to some audience questions? All right. We've got um, a question here. 
which is, would you suggest if it is healthy or unhealthy to respectfully discuss your salary within your organisation with other employees? Uh, I think it's illegal not to be able to. I, I think uh, people are often told, oh, no, you don't do that, you don't discuss it. But I think, uh, I think it's a good thing to do. I agree. Mm. Yeah. So it's not illegal. We're just <laughs> at clearing the air for that one there. Yeah, no, yeah. the law has changed in the last couple of years to say that people can't put that in your, in your contract, mm -hmm. that you're not allowed to discuss your salary. So um, mm. I'd encourage it. Yep. Any other additional comments? I definitely encourage it. The more information you have, the better. And Sonia's nodding. <laughs> um, look, there's another question here which sort of goes back to the de-identifying CVs, um, which has jumped to the top there. At what point do you hire a person to add to the company's diversity versus hire the person that will do the best job? Wow. Sorry, that's the merit question, isn't it? It's, tw it's 2024 and we still believe in the meritocracy. If we were in a meritocratic society, we wouldn't be sitting here having breakfast today, talking about how we deserve equal share. So there is there's tons of research out there telling businesses that actually it's excellent for all your teams to have diverse members. Mm -hmm. So let's get over this question. Mm -hmm. And that also speaks to what Jocelyn was saying earlier today too. Where is Jocelyn there? Yeah. So yeah, completely agree. Um, Jill, this might be one for you, um, and if you can s summarise it briefly, let me know. It might be a tricky one, but it's how do you define the gender pay gap? How is this calculated? Oh, oh ah, this is one for the numbers nerds amongst us. Um, what we do in the census is that your salary is within a particular range. You say you're getting between X and Y. and So we take the midpoint of that and then we find out how many people are earning that much in that salary band and then we, and then we keep adding it all up. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a weird thing that the gender pay gap is based on the male uh, salary. So mm -hmm. if I'm earning... 80,000 and a guy's were earning 100,000, there's a $20,000 difference. From my point of view, he's earning 25, uh, no, yeah, 25% more than me. But it's taken from his point of view and I'm only earning 20% less than him. So. <laughs> Those numbers, I'm just like, whoa, okay. <laughs> what was your thing? Yeah, okay. it, it, it's, a, it's a strange way of doing it, but that's the way it's kind of calculated. Okay, great. Well, whoever asked that question, I hope you got the answer you needed. Or come and see me afterwards. Come and see Jill afterwards. Um, there's a question here that I think is interesting. Um, uh, has there been a study of the experiences of migrant women architects with primary carer responsibilities in going through the registration process. Do we know of a research project doing that? Not to my No. Knowledge. So no. whoever asked that question, you can start doing the research. Um, the, the best um, studies of registration are done in South Australia. Okay. Uh, Susan Shannon has been doing that work for a long time, but I, I'm not even sure she's looked at that. Mm -hmm. It'll be an interesting um, topic to actually look into. Um, a question that I had in terms of ways to accelerate change, which sort of got me thinking about having research undertaken such as that. Um, Sonia, you know, you were a guest editor for the Migration Women Architecture Issue of Architecture Victoria, um, which is another way, I guess, to amplify these situations and circumstances. Um, again, I think the, I would be interesting to hear everybody's uh, opinion on this, but what are some other ways that we can accelerate this change beyond days of International Women's Day or a particular theme of a day or something? How can we actually continue this conversation beyond this a day like this? Join Parla. <laughs> At Parla, every day is International Women's <laughs> Day. <laughs> And we have a lot of resources and information there. There's, you know, uh, there's so much stuff, it's almost a bit hard to find. We're going to have to work on that, make it easier. But, yeah, there's so much stuff on Parlour. 
I think the answer, or part of it is don't stop talking about it. Mm. I've found in a lot of things that I've done, uh, or even currently doing, working with councils, um, you have to repeat and repeat and repeat yeah. and finally you might get. So today's event is wonderful and, and um, you know, supporting women, but we, we can't just stop. We have to keep going. We, uh, apart from today, every other day, every day is a day where you you get to say the same message again when you have the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can I talk about that issue a little bit? Um, so one of five incredible women who worked on this and 25 amazing contributors, Marika, um, Mariana, Mariam, Helen and myself. Um, and today's theme is counter in. These migrant women are consistently not being counted. And even as someone with 17 years in the industry, I've had incidents recently as three weeks ago where I haven't been counted. So if I'm facing this even now, imagine how much harder it's for them. So we decided that, like Parla, um, you know, you need to talk about these things and you bring it forward to as many people as possible. So we had kind of three aims with that project. Um, so we don't have the research on that yet, but hopefully that will happen in the future as a result of propping the door open with this. Um, so our aim was obviously to make them visible, so you can't count what you can't see. Um, secondly, to give them back their complexity, mm -hmm. because sometimes we are seen as a cohort, yeah? Mm. Just like, you know, women, we are a complex cohort. Some of us have caring responsibilities, some of us doesn't, don't. So please give them back their complexity. And third, to bring value and dignity to their lived experiences and the built cultures they come from. Mm -hmm. Because often that is stripped away from them through the act of migration and coming into the industry. So those were the aims. That publication has set off some amazing conversations that we have found looping back to us. And the biggest gift, and I think why we will not stop with just this publication, there will be stage two and stage three. We had a hundred expressions of interest mm, amazing. in a few weeks, and that was just in Victoria. I, don't, I can't imagine what the response would have been if we'd taken it national. So um, we want to count them in, and we really, with all our might, want to hold the door open and let, let this change continue. Mm, I think that's a good thing. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. Um, look, we're pretty much coming to the end of this conversation. I think to tie things up and just coming off the back of what you've just said there, Sonia, to be counted in, um, just to wrap it up nice and neatly, um, I think it'd be great to hear just one bit of advice that you've either shared today already in the conversation, but just as a quick summary on how women can invest in themselves and be counted professionally and financially. I was just saying when we were in the lobby before that if, you know, every person here took something out of what we said today and ran with it, then, you know, it'd be a roaring success. But I think it is advocating for yourself, having as many conversations as you can with people to promote yourself. And, and you know, we all have unique values and you need to make sure that they're, they're seen to progress in the way that you want to progress because you won't be progressing like the person that's sitting next to you. That's not how careers go. Um, so, you know, we all have a unique experience in our work life. Um, but yes, I think uh, advocate for yourself and, and talk to as many people as you can in your practice and outside to find your route through to where you want to be. And I agree with Felicity, um, but before you advocate yourself to others, advocate it to yourself. That's why I said earlier, sell yourself to yourself, believe in yourself, and then you advocate to everybody else, yeah. Uh, I, I think there are things that you, you can do yourself and that you must do yourself, um, but sometimes there's too much emphasis on that, and it's a bit like, oh, fix the women because we're faulty. Um, and I'm not a big fan of that. I think you can also ask or demand even for the opportunities um, and the support that you need to, to go further. So if you're in a, a performance meeting, you sort of go, I want to be in that upper quartile of pay. 
I think I've got the skills to be there. Do you agree? And if they go, oh, well, well I'm not sure, leave. <laughs> and then if they say, yes, we think you have, and you go, okay, now um, what opportunities are you going to give me and how are you going to support me? Because you can't do it on your own just by changing yourself. You can go so far, but you, you have to have a kind of supportive environment. Mm -hmm. Two things. Firstly, I have great empathy for those who are in the early stages of their career. It is often where the hardest and the most personal obstacles are. So I actually want to give you permission that if you can't advocate for yourself right now, that's okay. The scar tissue needs time to heal before you can speak. But once you get to mid-career, I truly believe like a phoenix, once you burn through that fire, you will emerge <laughs> and you'll find that voice. All right. And secondly, um, I lost the train of thought because people laughed. <laughs> <laughs> um, secondly, I, I, I truly hope that women realize the power of the collective. Everything that I love about architecture is when it shows its collective face. Everything that I find toxic about architecture is when it prioritizes the lone genius or the lone wolf. So discover the power of collectives. And your collective doesn't have to be huge. It could be five women that you know, yeah? And the collective doesn't always have to include senior women. It could even be your peers. But discover the power of a united voice. It roars. Amen. Do you want to say anything? Yeah. Um, Sonia and Felicity Jill, thank you so much for the discussion today, and I hope you all enjoyed it. And I think exactly what you said, let's be more part of the collective and invest in yourself. Um, thank you. <laughs>